Um, I think we can uh, can get started. It's um, uh, four o'clock, so it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Ibo Weiss, uh, who is an, uh, has done excellent work in, uh, in DMG uh, um, based, based methods. And uh, uh, I would say that's one of the big competitors for um, uh, quantum algorithms, but uh, at, the, at the other end, um, you could say also a uh, related method uh, in in a sense uh, so i think uh, it's a lot to be learned uh, on on, uh, uh, on either side uh, i'm looking forward to, to your talk and uh, i think uh, i'll not read out uh, the title because everybody could see it go ahead uh, Liba. okay thank you hello everybody hope you are doing well i must say this is really strange i don't i don't see you i see only the, the screen whatever so i'm gonna talk about uh, dmrg based methods as you said and uh, why at this workshop uh, as you also mentioned because uh, you know, DMRG and tensor networks in general is going to be the methods which will help to benchmark quantum simulations actually in the very first stage. Later on, uh, there certainly will be some competitions between them, but finally, I hope, I really hope that quantum simulation will be the winner and it will allow us to uh, solve uh, very complex uh, problems which uh, we cannot solve with the conventional methods due to, the, due to their limitations. <laughs> even if that means that we are unemployed. <laughs> okay, so from the outline, I will very, very briefly uh, introduce the problem, say a few words about uh, uh, tensor uh, networks, but I would like to rather concentrate on our recent works. And this is our uh, scalable QCDMRG implementation, which we have recently developed and tested. And then I'm going to talk about um, dynamical correlation because DMRG itself is a fantastic method, great method that can capture accurately strong correlation within some active space, which might be quite large. But if you would like to do some chemical predictions, you certainly need dynamical correlation outside of the active space. Yeah, there are several methods we have also recently worked on uh, tailored coupled clusters and uh, more recently also with adiabatic connection technique. So I'm going to mention that as well. So what we do in, uh, in chemistry, in quantum chemistry, we usually write our, our wave function as some reference, some RT fog usually, plus some correction. And when this correction is really small, we are in so-called weakly correlated regime or single reference if you want. Everything is fine because for very big systems, we have DFT or even you know, linear scaling coupled clusters, which are very accurate. For a uh, moderate system, we have we have canonical coupled clusters with fantastic accuracy. So it seems to be pretty okay. But the problem is when these corrections start to be large, right? Uh, we are in so-called uh, strongly correlated regime, or if you want multi-reference regime, and it may be even larger than the, the reference itself. And in that case, mean field approach completely fails, right? When does it happen? It happens when there is some uh, quasi-degeneracy in the underlying orbitals. Right. For example, this uh, this hydrogen lattice. This picture I think I took from the from the review paper of Sandeep Sharma and Garnet Chan, and this is not mentioned here, so I'm sorry for that. But then you can see large degeneracy. Uh, this is somewhat artificial system, but we don't have to go very far. Transition metal complexes are typical candidates with multiple transition metal atoms because then you have a large manifold of uh, close lying d orbitals and and the structures the, the electronic structure then become uh, quite complex this is the this is the core of the femoco this was mentioned many times here I, I have a feeling that this is like a holy grail for quantum simulation femoco uh, but of course this is very important i know so what to do then ideally we need something of a fusia quality but what does it mean fusia everybody knows it's impossible because of the scaling right if you write the wave function in the FUSIA expansion, this, these are the determinants in the occupation basis representation. They can be either empty, alpha, beta, or W occupied. Then the number of such configurations, if you have four possibilities and K orbitals, uh, it scales roughly as four to the K. Roughly you have some constraint on, on the number of particles, but whatever, it's exponential, right? Uh, it, uh, so, to, so to demonstrate it, if you take the double zeta basis for water, you have something like 10 to the 7 determinants. And if you go to benzene, you already have something like 10 to the 46. And this is not a big step. This is this exponential scaling. This is what we see now in the pandemic, by the way, anyway. So uh, what, can we, what can we do? What can we do currently with exact diagonalization? 
full CI or CASA CF, where there is a full CI inside that. This is coupled with orbital optimization. I think that currently we can treat something like 20 orbitals. This is like the maximum and it will not change much. But there is a question clever people asked before. If this is really necessary to exploit the full Hilbert space, all those determinants, because it may be that uh, the physical states which we are interested in, this means usually ground state or low lying excited state, they are somewhere in the corner. And then maybe that's a question Then maybe we can efficiently, accurately enough, efficiently uh, parameterize uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that corner. Yeah. And uh, one such uh, wave function parameterization, these are tensor networks. This is a this is a variational wave functions class of variational wave functions that somehow through through the contraction of those virtual indices um, uh, have, have introduced the principle of locality. Right. Uh, I will talk only about the very simplest, the matrix product states, uh, which were which were developed uh, to solve problems in one D. Not surprisingly, right? If you have, the, if this, sorry, if this is the the full CI uh, wave function high or the tensor K or the tensor, you can always factorize it in this matrix product state form on the on the right hand side. What does it mean? It means that inter you introduce some new auxiliary or virtual indices over which uh, there is a contraction, right? And if the dimension of these virtual indices is bounded, then uh, you can calculate efficiently with them and you can optimize optimize uh, the numbers in this uh, in this wave function representation. And the uh, higher this uh, dimension, which is called the bond dimension is, the more parameters certainly you have, and you have more accurate solution. And then this uh, full CI expansion coefficient can be uh, expressed as a product of matrices because there is a contraction. Uh, and this is why this is called matrix product states. It's a special class of wave function. And the nice thing about that is that actually the genuine uh, DMRG sweep algorithm developed by Stephen White in the 90s it was fine later on that it actually provides the wave function exactly in the matrix product state form. Um, and uh, in this sweeping algorithm, I don't want to go into the details of that. I don't have time for them, but uh, simply, simply said, uh, the sweeping means that iteratively you optimize uh, these matrix product state matrices one at a time, one at an iteration, with the rest is uh, kept uh, kept frozen from either some guess in the uh, initial stage and then from previous iteration. So you iteratively optimize one matrix product state at a time and you are sweeping until you reach some convergence. So this is roughly said how, how, how it is. Okay, this is the DMRG method. And if we apply it on uh, the quantum chemistry Hamiltonian, we have quantum chemical DMRG. Yeah, the Hamiltonian is much more complex than those uh, 1D, 1D models, but still we can in principle do that. I don't want to again talk about the details here because I think that nowadays DMRG, this is like a textbook method already. There are so many review papers about that. I mentioned here three nice reviews from different groups and also one uh, perspective from the group of Marcus a recent one. When if you are interested, uh, you can find a lot of, lot of uh, information I just want to point out a few, few things. One is, uh, if we use this uh, uh, quantum chemistry Hamiltonian, what does it mean? Uh, certainly, we have long-range Coulomb interaction and also molecule, this is, this is not a 1D problem, usually. Generic molecules are not 1D. So we actually have to somehow map, I'm sorry, the molecular orbitals onto the 1D uh, lattice uh, uh, for this sweeping. And uh, this we can do, for example, with the help of the mutual information. Uh, this means mutual information tells us how, how individual orbitals are correlated. And what we want for the DMRG computation, we want that the, the, the mostly correlated or, uh, orbitals are as close to each other as possible. So we can do some preliminary uh, calculation 
uh, calculate um, uh, the mutual information and then, then map, reorder those orbitals onto the 1D lattice. This is similar, like Alan in this uh, in his first talk, he, he mentioned that they use mutual information in terms of VQE, but they, according to the mutual information from the MRG, they can select which qubits to correlate, right? Uh, somewhat similar. So how it is viewed the MRG now uh, in chemistry, not in solid state physics, is viewed as a CAS-like approach. Uh, this is like an approximation to full CI with some active space, which may be, depending on the problem, say tens of orbitals. Yeah. The scaling is uh, is here, the dominant term is thread, so it's uh, k to the third power, where k is the number of orbitals, mn as well to the third power, this is the dominant term, where m is the bond dimension, so it's polynomial in this, um, uh, in this. but, uh, you know, how the bond dimension scales with the size of the problem and accuracy. This is a completely different story. So, okay, but I don't want to go into the details of that here. Okay, so uh, as I said, DMRG, this is not really a new thing, right? It was developed in the 90s, uh, introduced to chemistry by Stephen White, I think in 1999. Uh, so, but, you know, over the years, uh, many, many groups work on it, but I think, at least this is my impression, that only within the last few years, uh, uh, really computational chemists in their studies started to use this method almost as a mainstream for problems uh, which, like, which require large active spaces, for example, in the transition metal chemistry. So now we can see in the literature like DMRG, CASPT, TUNFPT studies of different transition metal complexes, and that's that's fantastic. So motivated by that, we wanted to push an envelope a bit right? um, of what is possible to do uh, in, in terms of uh, size of the active space, bone dimensions employed and stuff like that. Also motivated by the accessibility of supercomputers now, even uh, in the Czech Republic, we have, we have some we can apply uh, for a time and we tested our, our, our program there. So it's somewhat surprising, but this is this is really like that. And last but not least, we also had a feeling that there is some space on the market in this direction. So we decided that we will develop a new implementation. We call it Molen PS. This is a this is a, a collaborative effort of my colleague, especially Irka Brabets, uh, Erschlegeza from Budapest, and uh, last but not least, also Karol Kowalski from PNNL. And from from the features of our program. This is a C++ code, this is highly templated, and this is not a fancy MPO, uh, MPO implementation, which is, which is more than nine, but I would say, but this is, this is somewhat equivalent to that. And due to the developments of, uh, of Oeschlegeza over the years, we have quite a flexibility in Hamilton and definition. So we can also run different models like Hubbard, uh, quantum chemistry version, unrestricted, relativistic, more models can be done. Uh, it is based on an in-house global memory library. This is, a, this is a crucial part. At this point, I would like to say that parallelize the MRG, this is not a really trivial task. I think there is a paper by Garnechan already from 2003 or four, where he in detail described how to do the parallelization on distributed memory machines. In our approach, we, we, we do something different. Uh, we uh, inspired by, uh, by uh, parallelization techniques in, in, in quantum chemistry, we decided to, to go into the direction of this global memory uh, approach. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that in DMRG, we work with uh, some tensors and these tensors in our approach are distributed evenly over, over, over the cluster, right? So we, we use the memory of, of the nodes and then we can work with that ACA shared memory, like, like it was a shared memory model. So we, we can somehow employ the shared memory model of a parallelization on distributed memory ma machine. This certainly means that there will be more communication. This we knew from the very beginning. But on the other hand, supercomputer architectures, they, they, they have uh, fast internet connections. And if we do some clever tricks, we can minimize the communication. Uh, so this is what we did, as I will show you. 
our program has some post DMRT features. We can do opt orbital optimization, this tailored coupled clusters, or also uh, this adiabatic connection. And it is interface to NWCAM as well as ORCA. This is somewhat technical. I don't want to go into the details. Uh, uh, simply said, in DMRG, we work with matrices of operators, right? And since each operator has also some orbital index, we glue them together and we have we have uh, uh, three dimensional tensors. And uh, if we employ the sparsity of the problem uh, due to the quantum symmetries, right? Uh, what we do, so uh, at the end, we only work with the dense tensors of given symmetry sectors. And these dense tensors are uh, distributed uh, uh, among the cluster through the global memory approach. Our library, uh, this was developed by Irka Brabes. Uh, as I said, this is this is not. We originally wanted to we wanted to use global arrays, but then we decided to 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 do it ourselves. Uh, so our library uh, it supports two models, local and global. Local is for the smallest arrays because you don't want to move small chunks of data, right? And global model is uh, when this is really distributed. And this is uh, written pretty generally. So any intermediate of the DMRG calculations may be treated in a different model, purely based on the free memory, right? To maximize data locality. And Irka Brabez, he also developed, uh, developed sorry, something uh, we call semi-dynamic scheduler because we generate a huge number of tasks which are executed in parallel. And these tasks are assigned to the nodes where most of the data necessary for the computation is, right? To, again to employ uh, the, the the data locality at maximum yes so as i said through this global memory approach we can parallelize in a similar fashion like the shared memory way so what we do we combine operator uh, parallelism with the symmetry sector of parallelisms so we have the loops we merge loops we generate a huge amount of tasks then we you know, assign certain nodes, as, as, as I said before, and execute in parallel. So all important parts are task-based parallelized. Uh, maybe without going into the detail, the most demanding part is the Davidson procedure, Hamiltonian diagonalization. We expand uh, in the renormalized picture, we expand the wave function into two blocks and two sides, and then we have to apply the Hamiltonian on top of that. And so we have a huge list of operator combination, how we, you know, put different operators on, on, on different, uh, different uh, tensor uh, spaces uh, together with the symmetry. So we generate this task list and then perform in pa parallel. The same way we, uh, or in a similar way, we do the renormalization again, merge the loops. Uh, renormalization is a bit more difficult when it comes to the uh, to the communication, but as you will see, it's still cheaper at the end than than Davidson itself. And also another important uh, uh, another important part of DMRG uh, is presummation of operators, because for efficiency reasons, to minimize the number of matrix matrix multiplications, some operators are pre-contracted. These are like the intermediates which are used in this procedure, and since we uh, since we work really in the tensor space of two blocks and two sides, uh, we on the fly have to generate some, for efficiency reasons, some presumed operators which are not renormalized for the next step, okay? But again, this is task-based, so we have the list of the operators and symmetry sectors and everything is, uh, as I said. So what about the performance? Uh, the very first example, uh, this is the iron two porphyrin model. I will talk about it uh, also later. This is the active space compressing 34 orbitals, right? And the first, these two first two pictures, uh, sorry, okay, something happened. Okay, the first two pictures uh, correspond to bond dimension equal to roughly 2000. And this is the, this is the scenario where we can uh, fit everything into the memory of a single machine. So we can employ the uh, local data model. And this is a lock lock scale. And you can see that we can achieve the scaling up to some 2000 CPU cores for the systems for Davidson. And uh, renormalization and presummation also scales nicely. 
Mm, but you know, we were working on a supercomputer uh, which had, I think, 128 gigabytes per per node. So when we increase the bond dimension to uh, the, the the next two pictures correspond to bond dimensions equal to roughly 8,000, then we don't fit into the into the memory of a single uh, single node, and we have to employ the global data model, which inherently uh, has some communication. So you can see that the scaling is worse. But still, we can uh, scale, say, to some 2,000 CPU cores. In case of the in case of the renormalization, it's it's more problematic. I must admit that's true. But on the other hand, renormalization is always only a fraction of time to Davidson, so this is not a rate limiting step. Another two examples: uh, the left one, some Pico gated system we got from some collaborators, experimentalized. This is the active space of 36 orbitals, one dimension equal to roughly 4,000. And the scaling, reasonable scaling, okay, again, up to some 2,000 CPU cores. Right-hand side, this is the FEMOCO cluster. This is even larger active space, even larger bond dimension, 6,000. Uh, this was the calculation performed on the on the integral file from uh, from, from this web page from the Garnet Chance Group, their paper. Uh, and again, I think that uh, the good thing that renormalization doesn't scale really well, that's true, but this is still only a fraction uh, of the time of the Davidson itself. And I must say that this was the very first attempt which we published, and now we are improving upon it. Right? We, for example, would like to use GPUs as well. We work on the load balance. So I think that we will even improve, uh, improve more. Okay, so this was DMRG. We would like to do S large calculation is possible but this is not enough because we will not never we never will be able to uh, to do the full ci calculation on some large not large molecule we have to use the active space which might be tens of orbitals but the full space is hundreds of orbitals and as i said before to do some chemical predictions we need some dynamical correlation extensions there are some certainly people are using most usually DMRG CASPT2 and FP2, but their problem is that they need higher body reduced density matrices and these are expensive when you extend the active space. And this, this is what we like to do with our parallel implementation. So, recently we have worked on uh, two uh, such methods which avoid this problem. The very first one is the tailored coupled cluster approach. This uh, DLP, and we have also this, this is the DLPNO. It means domain-based local parnature orbital. This is like a linear scaling coupled clusters advocated by Frank Neza in Orca. So we also have this, but uh, otherwise this is DMRG tailored coupled clusters with up to parentheses T. And the next one is uh, DMRG CASSCF uh, with so-called adiabatic connection correction developed by, uh, by Professor Pernal, I'm going to mention. So first of all, these tailed coupled clusters. This theory is really quite simple. This is based, this is essentially a single reference theory. It uses the split amplitude ansatz. It means that uh, you have this cluster operator and you, you split it into some active space part and some external part. And, and the point is that you calculate those active space amplitudes with some external method, in our case, the DMRG. And when you obtain the coupled cluster Amplitudes, I'm sorry. Uh, then in a subsequent single reference coupled cluster calculation, you keep those amplitudes frozen and you tailor, to, you, you basically set their residuals to zero and you relax only the external ones. Right? So the external ones are tailored by, by these active space amplitudes and these active space amplitudes, they are supposed to account for the strong correlation and the rest for the, for the dynamic correlation. And what is beautiful about this method that it requires only modification of the coupled cluster code. So it can be simply implemented. We have implementation in all kind in WKM as well. So again, active space, you do some DMRG calculations. Then you have the matrix for X state form. You can calculate the CI singles and doubles coefficients by contraction of those uh, MPS matrices. From that, you can calculate coupled cluster singles and doubles amplitudes plug them into the next CCSD calculation and relax only the external. How does this work? Uh, this is the typical example, chromium dimer. We, we took this because this is a single point calculation in uh, rather a rather small basis set because uh, in the Garnet Chance group, uh, they extrapolated the DMRG energy to the full CI so we can compare. And as you can see, as you can see, uh, 
with some small active space, 12 orbitals, uh, 12 electrons, we are beating uh, uh, CCSD parenthesis T. If we increase, we are almost achieving CCSD TQ. And for this 1221, we are beating CCSD TQ. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. We did several benchmarks, but uh, instead of going into other benchmarks, I would like to mention one uh, numerical study where we employed this method. And this is this iron 2 porphyrin model, this small molecule here. This was extensively studied by Limani, and they concluded in their works that to, to, to properly describe the system, you need to employ a large active space, like 34 orbitals in the active space. You basically have to include all pi orbitals. And uh, they uh, uh, estimated the, the ground state to be the triplet and the gap to be triplet quintet gap to be something like 60 calories per mole. However, there are some recent experiments on this large system, which is this iron phthalocanin, and they suggest that for, for solvents which are similar, uh, similar to, to, to the gas, they most resemble the gas phase calculation. This should be the ground state, should be the quintet. So we wanted to study this and see. How is how is how it really is, and we use the DMRG CF. This is here, uh, and our results are similar to Limani and his uh, Fusia QMC CF. So the triplet is the ground state. But when we then uh, turn on the dynamical correlation, uh, actually we stabilized the quintet state slightly. But I wanted to point out different thing. We tried different geometries and also tried to calculate the adiabatic. Yeah. These are the dashed line diadiabatic. It means that we also, with the DFT, optimize the structure of the quintet. And as you can see, the problem is that in the other geometries, there is the difference between the distance between the iron and uh, nitrogen. And uh, as you can see, the adiabatic gap, the quintet, is safely separated from the triplet, something like 15 kcal per mole. OK, this is fine. Uh, we published, but there was some criticism from the referee, which was completely fair, that this small model is uh, really flexible. It's not rigid like the porphyrin itself. So in order to generalize to porphyrin, uh, that's questionable. So motivated by that, we said, okay, we can do even larger. We can do porphyrin. Uh, so we perform, uh, till now we perform this DMRG CCF calculations in this large active space. And what we do, we, we really stretch the iron uh, nitrogen distance and relax the rest of the molecule. And as you, kiss, as you can see in the graph, even for this system, the quintet at this level of theory is lower in energy. So we will see what dynamical correlation will do, but it's, it seems promising with respect to the, to the experiment I mentioned on the previous slide. And the uh, last thing before, before ending, uh, I would like to mention this adiabatic connection. This is the theory developed by, uh, by Kasia Pernel in, in Poland. Uh, this is really an interesting theory, which is quite promising to be uh, combined with some uh, methods like Kassasia, where you can afford to do very large active space, because at the end, it depends on only one and two body reduced density matrices. I don't have much time, so I don't want to go into the detail of that. I will just tell you that there are some approximations employed in this, uh, in this uh, when deriving this adiabatic correction. And these are the most important are that uh, she assumes that uh, one particular density matrix is constant on the adiabatic path, which on the other hand is justifiable as long as the large active space captures all the static correlations because dynamic correlation is supposed not to alter uh, this uh, one body density matrix. Uh, okay, and then also we employ uh, some AC, some approximation which is called AC0, where because this correction has some integral form, whatever is done, not, not important, this is, I don't have time to, to, to discuss that, but uh, linearity of this integrand is, uh, is assumed in this AC0 approximation. But Kasia Pena in her works, because it's her theory, she showed that this AC0 approximation is almost as accurate as the original one, and is much, much cheaper the original one. And basically in, in her works she show that this uh, uh, methodology is able to give something like DMA, uh, something like NFPT2 quality of results. So we tried it. We interfaced it with our DMRG code 
And the first benchmark which we tested, this is this these are these poly polyacin. This is notoriously known. Everybody tries methods, uh, multi reference method on them. If you increase their size, you increase the multi reference character. And the very first thing which we were interested was how much the accuracy of the orbital optimization via the DMRGSCF influences the accuracy of this correction. On the example of this tetracin, you can see that this is pretty cool. That uh, you can you can use bond dimensions of the order of 200, and there is not really a big change. This is actually less sensitive than the DMRG itself. And when we look on the singlet triplex vertical gaps uh, on the on, on this picture on this graph, you can see that really we are improving uh, a lot the DMRG SCF with the AC0 correction. We are comparing with the high level DMRG MC. Uh, multi-reference configuration interactions, singles, doubles. And there is one important point before really ending. I would like to stress. Tailored coupled clusters, this is great, but it has, every method actually has some advantages and disadvantages. And the biggest disadvantage of this is that this is based on the single reference theory. And you really need to have some reference which has uh, non-negligible overlap with the exact wave function. Because there you work in the intermediate normalization and you have to divide by the weight of this uh, reference uh, uh, the CI coefficients. And if this is negligibly small, you are in trouble. On the other hand, this Aryabhati connection, which is not as sophisticated in terms of correlation, uh, it uses CASA CF as a reference. And the bigger the active space, the better. So I think, and it can achieve something like NFPTT quality, according to the uh, uh, Kasia Pernal test on small small molecules, we will see. So I think that this is a hot candidate for systems like these iron sulfur clusters, where really the, the uh, wave function is so complex, you need to use very large active space. Uh, I think this, this could be a method of choice, we will see. So in summary, DMRG is a great method. Over the years, I think it's a mainstream. We can do it on a supercomputer in a fraction of time, as I showed you, do a few node calculation. Tailored coupled clusters have advantages, disadvantages. It can be accurate approach as long as you have some reasonable reference. And the Aryabhati connection technique uh, can be good even if you don't have it. Okay, that's it. I would like to acknowledge my students and, and collaborators. And thank you for the attention. Thank you, uh, Lieber. Uh, impressive uh, <coughs> progress uh, over the years with uh, DMG. Uh, especially also like uh, the, your effort to, to parallelize things. I have a question on that, but I'll, I'll first uh, give the floor to uh, uh, to others. Um, Bruno Saint Jean has uh, some questions uh, put on on the Slack. Uh, I'll start with that, uh, Bruno. Um, if if you uh, unmute yourself, you can ask it yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talk. So I have uh, two questions, one uh, which uh, is uh, uh, already kind of answered by Matthias uh, de Hout. So uh, the question is, uh, do you know why it took so much time for chemists to use DMRG instead of CAS-SCF? Yeah. Well, this is um, CAS-SCF, uh, both, uh, in, in case of both, you have to first define the active space, right? So say that you know what orbitals to include into the active space, then a uh, CASCF is, is more black box, certainly. In the MRG, you have to play with the ordering of the orbitals, but it can be done also now automatically. For example, you know, Erschlegeza is the next speaker. He will tell you he's the master of this mutual information and stuff like that. I think that nowadays it can be also used as a black box. But you, you have to set up more parameters in case of DMRG than you have to do in case of CASA-C, a very due to exact diagonalization. I think that you are muted. Uh, Bruno, you, you have to unmute again. <laughs> so do you think it could replace uh, definitely CASA-CF at some point? Or... No, 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 no. Mm. Uh, because for small active spaces, it will not be faster. There is some computational overhead. So if you are interested in systems uh, of, I don't know, CAS active, active space like 12 orbitals, conventional active uh, CAS CA will be faster than DMRG. DMRG is good. You know, there is a trade-off. If you increase the size of the active space, then you will win. Okay. And uh, one last uh, question. Um, 
how do you think using range separated DFT combined with DMRG uh, could be competitive with a tailored CCDMRG or the adiabatic connection? Yes, there are. There are. Uh, I know that this is not the only approach. Of course, this is. There are many, many others. One, one is the the, the DFT, the range separated DFT. Yes, this is very interesting. I must say. Uh, I think it's promising, but this is a DFT, so it has its pros and it has its cons. Uh, yeah. It's it's faster, but you have a functional, right? And you are restricted to the functional, for example. And I think that there are also problems with double counting in this case regarding the correlation. I think this is not fully resolved, or I'm not really sure. Yeah, I guess it needs some uh, some more research. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for the question, uh, Bruno. Uh, I don't see any any others in the Slack. I have one myself, and if, if people uh, have more questions, please raise your hand uh, here. Oh, I, I I'll, I'll type it in. Ah, oh, sorry, I uh, somehow don't see it. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Dimitri. Yeah, quick, yeah. Quick question. Uh, great talk. And uh, uh, just can you remind me for the Hamiltonian operator? Are you using the matrix product operator form or just directly applying? No, we don't. I was. Uh, I was too, 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 maybe too fast. We don't use MPO formulation. No, no. We we really use the traditional. Uh, we, we use renormalized operators. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But still, yeah. As I said, we are pretty flexible in uh, Hamiltonian definition. So we have several models implemented, and we can rather quickly change and even uh, implement the new ones. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have actually a question about your parallelization. Actually, uh, nice that Dimitri is here because I'm, I'm working on, on parallelizing red twisted coupled cluster uh, together with, with him. And one thing we, we threw aboard, uh, off a board uh, immediately was symmetry because it complicates things. So you, you, are, you use symmetry in your parallelization, but, but what about uh, larger molecules typically don't have symmetry? I mean, the ones you, you showed have quite some symmetry, but I mean, not in general. Yeah, but we don't we don't use if you mean point group symmetry. Yeah, that, that uh, so maybe I misunderstood that. So so so, yeah. so what kind of symmetry do, do you use? Uh, uh, we use uh, the U one symmetry, particle number symmetry, because when you when you work with the renormalized states, uh, each can be characterized with a given number of alpha and beta electrons. Simply put, and so so uh, these all the operators can be. Uh, are sparse in, in this basis. Uh, so we ah, should... okay. So, so it's basically the, the spin symmetry you're talking about. Yeah, of course. I mean, so, that's what... Like as as yeah. Z's, as, as Z's yeah. the projection. There are implementation already. Su two implementations. We will also do. We are working on Su Su two as well. But it works mm -hmm. in a similar in in a similar way. You have basis state. You you have basis states of a given symmetry. So you can factorize your operators into the sub blocks according to this symmetry. Basically, so we don't we don't use point group uh, mm -hmm. because uh, for the MRG the best basis is a local basis, so it will it will break the point group symmetry anyway. Only yeah. for very small molecules you can use it maybe advantageously, but I I think the MRG is not suitable for small molecules. Okay, that, that is clear. Uh, that clarifies it. Thanks. Uh, 